Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for attending the Money Show Orlando. We're delighted that you all are here with us today. My name is Aaron West, and I'm the president of Money Show. We'd like to say a very quick thank you to our sponsors. Merrill Edge, our gold sponsor, Fidelity and Tasty Trade, our bronze sponsors, and to all of our special event sponsors and media partners. Without their support, we wouldn't be here today. So please visit the exhibit hall and say thank you uh, when we open this evening. I'd also like to say a very special thank you to the Money Show team. We've got 38 people that work with us in Sarasota, Florida, that work tirelessly to provide 10 events across the United States and also in Canada. Um, we really would like for you to stop them in the hallway and say thank you. I'm sure that they would be glad that you did. At this year's event, more than 4,500 investors and active traders will attend over a four-day period. All of you have the opportunity to participate in everything here at the show from the special pre-show tracks that we held this morning, including the All-Stars of Options event, the Women on Wealth and Money Show University event that's still going on today. With all of the, of the incredible content that's, that's happening here at, our, at the show, it's our hope that you'll take advantage of everything that Money Show has to offer. Of the more than 7,000 people that pre-registered for the conference, more than 48% have never registered for a Money Show event in the past. So for those of you that are new to the events and may not be as familiar with us, I'd like to share a very quick background on the company itself. Money Show's been educating investors and traders for more than 38 years at over 500 conferences on five continents and 30 cities around the globe. These conferences offer you, the active investor, an unbiased and independent format that gives you the opportunity to meet with the world's leading investment and trading experts to reap the benefits of their wisdom. We also have a community of hundreds of thousands of investors and traders that are very active on our website, moneyshow.com, where they find expert opinions on global markets and ideas for how to profit from them. If you've not visited the website, I would encourage you to do so, as you'll find the same unbiased expert advice that you find here at the show online, 365 days a year. In fact, I'd like to say good afternoon to those of you that are watching online today. They're logged on and they're gonna watch throughout the duration of this afternoon because we've got an incredible program for you. And for the entire audience, both online and the people here in this room, at this money show here in Orlando, we've packed it full of knowledge, wisdom, and expert ideas from the best experts. You'll meet and share experiences with like-minded investors while discovering stocks, bonds, ETFs, and other things to buy and other strategies to employ so that you can make money in the markets today. We've assembled a stellar lineup of speakers, panels, and companies to ensure that your experience at Money Show will give you an unparalleled immersion into how to become a more profitable investor. Now, just remember, it, it's only gonna take one idea to make this entire event worthwhile. So make sure that you listen out to the people that you're sitting next to, as well as the experts that you hear from on the podium. We've designed the show utilizing content verticals. And your show schedule inside your bag, if you pull out your official show program on page 22 and each day thereafter, you'll notice at the top of the page there are keywords such as alternative investing, the income and growth summit, ETF investing, and others. These keywords outline the subject matter of each room so that you can quickly and easily identify and find the, most ses the sessions that are most relevant to what you want to accomplish here at the conference. And also, as you plan your personal agenda on the left-hand side over there where the times are, please be sure to note that the type of presentation that's being given, either editorial or educational in nature or one that is a product session. We've clearly identified that in more than the 
in more than 250 presentations that we have going on here at the show, I would like for you all to please promise me to do your due diligence before making any changes to your portfolio. It's so critical to do that due diligence and not make any changes before doing your research. And so you can make the most out of your show experience. I wanted to be sure that you all knew about a number of exciting things that are going on here at the show. And I also want you to notice that throughout the conference, we've incorporated more experiential activities, things like an ice cream break, our golf tournament that's gonna be going on Saturday night, and a new uh, morning run. So please get involved in those kinds of experiences. It will really enrich uh, the experience that you have here at the show. So first of all, the welcome reception and grand opening of the exhibit hall. Please don't miss it tonight at 6.30, directly after these uh, keynote addresses in the Osceola C and E room. Tomorrow, we've got the Money Show Run and Walk at 7 to 7.45, and then we're gonna jump right into keynote addresses here in this room, beginning at 8 a.m. Then we have our exhibit hall opening at 10.15, and then we've got more than 100 breakout sessions throughout the day. Tomorrow, I also want to tell you about a very special charity auction that's gonna be taking place tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Treasure Investments will be conduct conducting a live auction of a beautiful bronze piece by Lorenzo Guilieri, valued at $27,000. Not only will the winner of the auction take home this beautiful bronze piece of art, but 100% of the proceeds will be donated to the charity of the winner's choice. Pretty incredible. So I'll share with you that this auction is only limited to 50 people. So if you'd like to sign up to be in attendance, to have the opportunity to win this fantastic bronze sculpture, make sure that you go by the uh, Treasure Investments booth number 411 to secure your spot in this exclusive event. Saturday, we've got another day packed with content. More than 100, 100 presentations begin at 8 a.m. And of course, the exhibit hall featuring live product demonstrations from the bullpen opens at 945. We also have a can't miss lunch event at 1145 a.m. We hope that you'll join us. There's tickets still available. It's our top pros, top picks lunch panel. Each year, our editorial team asks the nation's leading financial newsletter advisors for their favorite stock, pick, stock picks for the year ahead. And this is your shot to hear their very best ideas for 2019. And for those of you who like golf, I'll be hosting a golf tournament underneath the lights on the par three course at the back of the hotel on Saturday evening at 6 p.m. So we'd love it if you came out and played golf with us. It'll be great. And on Sunday, we've got a couple of post-show events with Eagle Financial Publications and Kami Zaraki and Better Investing. They have their interactive stock clinic that's going on. So tack on an extra day, stay here at the Omni and take advantage of all the show has to offer. And speaking of taking advantage of everything the show has to offer, if you like the very best, we would encourage you to take a look at our diamond and platinum membership experience. If you look inside your program, inside that directory I referenced earlier, you'll find that we have 11 paid for master classes that are going on at this event. They're $139 a piece. However, if you purchase a platinum or diamond membership at this event, you'll have access to every single one of those master classes. Plus, as a platinum or diamond member, you can attend any of our 10 conferences throughout the United States throughout 2019 and go to any or all of those master classes. That's more than 75 master classes in total throughout 2019. In addition, if you can't make it to the face-to-face -face event, we'll send you the transcripts and audio files from all 75 presentations throughout 2019. So we think that we've packed this program with a lot of value and we hope that you take a look at it. And to encourage you to become one of our members, we'd like to offer you the opportunity to get $100 off your Platinum and Diamond membership when you purchase it here at the show. Just visit my colleagues Kathy and Jessica at the registration desk and they'll be sure to help you out. 
And if you'd like to receive up to the minute schedule details, because from time to time we do have some changes to the schedule, I would encourage you to download our app. In order to do, in order to do so, you can visit apps.moneyshow.com, or you can go into the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and just search for Money Show Events, download the app, and find speaker schedules, find biographies on speakers, where booths are, so on and so forth. And finally, when you go home, please know that we're live streaming almost 70 presentations from this event. When you look in your official show program, at the bottom right-hand corner of each presentation, you'll notice a little orange play button, which indicates that the event is being live streamed. To watch these presentations when you go home, all you need to do is go to watch.orlandomoneyshow.com and you'll see the entire roster of events that we have available for you. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our, our mistress of ceremonies today, Kim Githler. She was driven by the need to empower individual investors and founded Money Show back in 1981. Over the course of 38 years, she's educated millions of investors, traders, and financial advisors. In 2014, Ms. Githler was honored by the New York Stock Exchange for educating investors when she was invited to ring the closing bell. Not only has she had a major impact on millions of investors around the world, but she's also impacted thousands of expert educators and organizations in the financial services industry. Ms. Githler works tirelessly to raise awareness for, the, for, financial, in, for financial education and was recently named one of the 500 most influential people by Florida Trend Magazine and one of the top 100 most influential libertarians by Newsmax. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Kim Githler. Aren't I blessed to have someone like Aaron West as the president of our company? He is at the helm and he works tirelessly with our team to bring you everything you see here today. So I really appreciate your passion for our team and your passion for our investors. Thank you, Aaron. I'm also uh, sharing with you how many of you saw the previous uh, slides going through, rehearsing my your hand. How many of you, after watching that, know how old I am? <laughs> well, as my mother likes to say, that number is unlisted. <laughs> However, you will see that I have not aged before your eyes with the wonderful uh, experts you saw before you, but they have. No, really, they are what has made this an amazing run. I also want to share with you that I have the delightful pleasure to work with my son by my side, and many of you know him because he has, he has badged, he has worked with our speakers, and now he works by my side in this business. Charlie Githler, will you please stand? Louis Rukeyser said that he loved traveling with Charlie because it was the only time he got to play with toy soldiers. <laughs> so, it was great. You have done a lot. Thank you, honey, for being here. So to our passionate investors in the audience, I really want to welcome you and thank you for being here. How many of you have ever attended a money show before? Please raise your hands. It's amazing. Thank you so very, very much. Well, as you know, my purpose in life since I started this company so many years ago was to make a difference in people's lives and the quality of their personal financial well-being. I am humbled and grateful to have had shared this mission with some of the most greatest and most powerful advocates like 
Louis Rukeyser, John Templeton, and yes, our dearest and loved Jack Bogle. As you saw on the opening slides and this slide here, Jack was an advocate that attended our events and gave freely of his time to educate investors. He, like the other legends and pioneers in investor education, was an original disruptor of the asset management business on Wall Street, having created the index fund and being a relentless advocate for all of us. Sadly, we lost him in January at the young age of 89. As I quote another old friend and educator in the business, Don Phillips of Morningstar, Jack will be remembered by helping ordinary people realize a bit of their dreams and the quality of their lives in their retirement years. To Jack, that was his greatest reward in life. Let's all take a moment to be grateful to Jack for all the wonderful opportunities he has given to us. Thank you, Jack. Like these amazing legends that I have had the privilege to know and learn from, <clears throat> we have created for you today an amazing lineup of keynote presentations from the finest world economist, equity research analysts, money managers, and financial consultants. Our goal has always been to want you to go behind beyond the news of the day. At Money Show, you can get a deep immersion and a complete macro perspective in the overall market. This will give you the confidence you need to pilot your course to outperform the market. These are challenging times for investors. Coming off the market's worst December since the Great Depression and the huge volatility swings we investors have experienced in 2018. So now more than ever, it is essential for a peace of mind to invest with more caution and perspective in 2019. I, along with Debbie Osborne in the back of the room, have hand-selected the keynotes that you will see this afternoon and tomorrow from all areas of investing, both domestically and globally, so that we can achieve our number one goal from these presentations, which is to look at the big picture and identify the macro trends that will affect your personal portfolio allocation. So here is my list of macro trends that I'm looking at and want to get the most out of in this next day and a half, and then I follow people into their workshops to get the specifics. But you're all old dogs here, so I know that you'll be able to do that very effectively. I know that Washington policy drives a lot, but so does Chinese policy. So you have an amazing speaker that's going to speak to you after I do by the name of Mark Mobius. Mark Mobius is one of the greatest minds in the world on the emerging markets. And he actually was John Templeton's closest advisor taking John Templeton and the Templeton Funds across Asia and across all emerging markets. So you are very lucky. So he will share with you a little bit about policy in Asia. Energy, Asia and China, emerging markets, Fed policy. We have some of the greatest minds in the world on Fed policy here. I was delighted to see my friend uh, uh, Larry Kudlow eight weeks uh, after he spoke at Orlando last year to be named the economic advisor to Trump, and now David Malpass has been named uh, the head of World Bank, who also spoke for us in San Francisco. I'm delighted, and I think they'll do great with policy. U.S. corporate earnings, sector selecting, the dollar, Brexit, the Europe factor, and most importantly, technology. We have a brilliant person speaking tomorrow, and I don't want you to miss it, Howard Tolman. Howard Tolman I heard for the first time in Chicago almost a year ago. He is a brilliant technology futurist. He's a billionaire, and I want you to hear him tomorrow, so write down Howard Tolman. So goal number two is to identify specific ideas or economic trends that you may discover while attending this event, and doing your due diligence to carefully maximize how you will apply these thoughts and strategies. 
Our attendees say they walk away with many ideas that create a more disciplined and knowledgeable approach to investing at these events. But what I want to remind you to do is take lots of notes, log on after, because you, you can take the notes, but I really want you to be clear when you're making any changes, and I very much want you to do your due diligence before making any change in your wealth strategies. Also remember, your with many like-minded investors. That is the silver lining here. It truly, truly is. And what I mean by that is many of you have created this conference. You've given me ideas for speakers. You've told me exactly what you want to hear in terms of trends. You have been the greatest advocate and builder of this business. You know the best experts out there. You know what stocks you're buying in ETFs. Share it with your neighbor. Connect. You are the ultimate social media for financial behavior and sentiment at this conference. So please talk to each other. Now, I always like to leave you with a little thought, um, and that is, how many of you know how much the S&P 500 accelerated in terms of uh, growth? How much, in a percentage basis, did the S&P go up in the 10-year bull run we just had with share buybacks? It was $4 trillion, but it was 30% of the gain, 30% of the gain of that bull market. So you need to learn these little tidbits because you say to yourself, gee, if we don't have the buybacks next year, what happens? So that's what we like to do is perk your curiosity and give you little tidbits to investigate. I'd like to end today's presentation with a phrase that many of our successful investors and educators take very seriously, and I am a huge advocate of it, which is knowledge is power. So thank you for being here. And the other thing I heard the other day, which I really liked and I wanted to share with you, is knowledge is the slave that soothes many a fear. Knowledge is the slave that soothes many a fear. And my saying is, patience is a skill for investing, but I believe perspective is the art of investing. I am thrilled that you are here. And I wish you great success in your financial future. So thank you very much. Thank you. So without further ado, this is really where the rubber meets the road. And of course, our first speaker is someone who is very near and dear, dear to my heart because uh, his mentor for many, many years was John Templeton. And he ran the Templeton money for many, many years. Um, and his name is Mark Mobius. Mark Mobius, uh, along with John Templeton, has been an advocate of our company. And I think you spoke for us in Asia, and you spoke for us in Europe. You are an undying advocate for investors and investors in independence. And we are so grateful to you. And I cannot wait to hear your perspective on China from this podium. And I know everyone here is waiting for you to speak. But too often, the emerging market asset class is viewed as a passive investment. It's time to enter or exit emerging markets. However, at any given time, there are good and bad investments in the sector. John Templeton used to say, if there's a bad investment here, there's always a good investment there. And you need to open your eyes, not just have your blinders on. Dr. Mobius, known as the founder of the emerging market asset class, specializes in knowing where to place your emerging market bets. In May in 2008, I'm delighted to say, with two ex-colleagues, he launched Mobius, Mobius Capital Partners which utilizes a specialized active investment approach to rate emerging and frontier market companies. Prior to this, Dr. Mobius was employed at Franklin Templeton Investments as the executive chairman of Templeton Emerging Markets Group. He is a brilliant market investor. Please help me welcome Mark Mobius.
what an introduction. Thank you very, very much. I didn't expect that kind of introduction, uh, but it's a real pleasure to see all of you here today. And I'm very happy to have so many people in this room. You know why? You warm it up. I get very, very cold because I lose a lot of heat through my head and uh, the air condition usually <laughs> is too high. So it's great to see. So what I'd like to do today is take you through a little adventure uh, that I've had over the years and uh, just to give you a little insight into my thinking and the incredible changes that have taken place. Um, I just flew in last night from Singapore, and I remember when I first went to Singapore in the 70s, when I was 10 years old, um, <laughs> it was a, a fishing village. Now, I don't know whether you've seen it, in fact, by the way, one of the nice things about being in Asia is that you celebrate New Year's twice. Because you have the Western New Year's, and I, we had great fireworks in Singapore, and then the night before last, they had Chinese New Year fireworks. I wish I could show you the fireworks, it was incredible. But anyway, uh, you see these cities change so dramatically. So that's one of the things I'd like to talk about today with you, to give you some idea of the change that's taking place. For example, 25 years ago, this is what Shanghai looked like. Uh, in the foreground is the famous Bund, you know, that was the place where, uh, before the war, the famous uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, Chartered Bank were there. And then over there in the background was Pudong. It was fishing villages, small houses, etc., etc. This is what it looks like today. <laughs> the same picture from the same place. Isn't that incredible? And by the way, you see there the building uh, with a sort of a square in the middle. You see that, sort of a rectangle in the middle, it's second highest building. That was built by uh, the Japanese investor, Mori. He's one of the largest property investors in, in Japan. And the original design for that building was not a square, but it was a circle. It was a hole. Do you know why they changed it? the Japanese flag. You don't want the tallest building in China to look like a Japanese flag. So they changed it, and then the Chinese built a taller one next door. You can see that. <laughs> if you looked at Dubai 25 years ago, <laughs> this is what it looked like. We had an office, by the way, in the building in the background. And today, this is what it looks like. And by the way, if uh, any of you have a chance, please visit Dubai. It's just incredible. Uh, this building is so inspiring. By the way, that tallest building in the world was uh, designed by Skidmore Owens, you know, the American firm that does tremendous buildings around the world. Uh, they don't get the credit for it because they usually, you know, try to not say that a foreigner built the building, but that's what happened. And in the foreground, underneath that, they have these incredible water shows, uh, similar, actually about three times larger than the one in Las Vegas, every half hour with music and so forth. Just incredible. Can American women go there alone? Oh yes, American women can go there alone. Uh, Dubai is not uh, Saudi Arabia. Dubai is part of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and they're very, very open. You have lots of foreigners there. Uh, you see girls with uh, mini skirts uh, next to a woman who's completely in black, uh, covered up completely. So it, it's, it's quite open. You can't drink. You can't have alcoholic beverages except in the hotels, but they, you know, they won't have a open bars, some places like that. But generally speaking, I found it to be very, very easy and open, very peaceful, very safe, uh, a very well run uh, 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 part of the world. Very, very nice place. So I strongly recommend uh, for you to go. Uh, it's a good idea not to wear too skimpy a dress, but otherwise you're okay. <laughs> 
Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. This is what it looked like 25 years ago. This is what it looks like today. And those two buildings, by the way, were built uh, by Mr. Mahathir, who the prime minister, who uh, left, retired, and now he's come back as prime minister. And uh, I, always, I was telling the Malaysians, you know, you people are really environmentally friendly. Said, what do you mean by that? I said, you're recycling your prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> so, and as you know, now Dubai has the tallest building in the world. Uh, these two towers used to be the tallest buildings in the world. And someone told Mr. Mahathir, hey, you're no longer the tallest in the world. He said, yeah, but we've got two. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's a wonderful place to visit. In 1987, when John Templeton asked me to start the Emerging Markets Fund, these were the markets shown in yellow that we were able to invest in. Only six markets. Mexico, Hong Kong, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Everything else was closed. There were st no stock markets, socialist governments, communist governments, of course, Russia and China were all communists. So there was very, very few places where we could invest. We struggled uh, to invest. Today, this is where we are. 70 markets around the world where we can invest. I just came back uh, before I was in Singapore. I was in India. India's got a thriving stock market, wonderful companies, uh, incredible managements. Of course, China has now privatized a lot of the industry. So you really find tremendous opportunities in these places and very great surprises that you'll find in some of these places. Now, of course, the question is, why are we in emerging markets? And the key word is growth. Emerging markets are growing. They have young populations. If you look at the GDP growth for 2018, last year, the average for emerging markets, you'll see most of them are emerging market countries. The only exceptions are the United States and Japan. All these other countries have huge populations. Of course, China and India are over one billion people each. Uh, it's incredible when you think about it. When you go to China, they have everything. There's so many companies, so many things going on. And the same thing with India. As you go from one state to another, you find incredible things happening because it's a huge, huge uh, population, a huge market. Emerging markets is a percent of the world population, of course, 70 percent. Foreign exchange and gold reserves, 65 percent. Land mass, you can see, exports, GDP, all big, big percentages as a percent of the world. By the way, I don't know if many of you, uh, many of you realize that uh, China is the largest producer of gold in the world. And of course, they have lots of gold reserves, probably a lot of it not revealed that we know about. And of course, if you look at the market capitalization, you see back in 2003, emerging markets represented less than 3% of the market capitalization of the world. Now it's well over 20% and growing. I think not before long, it'll be 30, 40% of the total. Risk. A lot of people ask me, hey, isn't it risky? Of course, all markets are risky, and emerging markets are no exception. You've got political risk, you've got currency risk, you've got all kinds of company risks, and so forth and so on. But if you look at things like debt, it's surprising to see private sector debt as a percent of GDP in the major emerging market countries, the so-called BRICS. Brazil, Russia, China, India, and of course you've got South Africa there. With the exception of China, the private sector debt as a percent of GDP is less than US, Canada, and the UK. By the way, I've left uh, Japan out of here because the chart would be off the map. Government debt as a percent of GDP, again, you can see with the exception of Brazil, most of these emerging countries have less than the developed countries. So there's lots of stability in some of these countries in terms of the, the factor like that. 
Foreign reserves. These countries, as a result of the Asian financial crisis, have built up tremendous foreign reserves. And you can see all these countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South, even South Africa, have higher foreign reserves as a percent of GDP than the US, Canada, and Mexico. And then the US, rather. Now, one of the things that I found is technology is having an incredible impact on these countries. If you look at the internet, which country in the world has the highest internet usage? Not the US, China. China. China has the highest internet usage in the world. It's incredible. You know, I was in China four months ago, <coughs> excuse me, and we were at a restaurant and of course, you know, by the way, one of the customs in Asia is that everybody offers to pay. I know in America you share, sit around and share the, the, the bill. In China, no, you have to offer to pay. And of course, I was the senior, I was the oldest, I had to pay. <laughs> so I took out my credit card, not acceptable. I took out cash, I had renminbi, not acceptable. Finally, I was having a dinner with my former staff in China. One of the, my colleagues took out his cell phone. He said, okay, I'll pay, bang. With his cell phone, he was paying. This is what's happening in China. Everything is being done with these cell phones. People have smartphones and they're paying with these things. It's just incredible. And that's the reason why you have this very high internet usage. And the reason, of course, is that global smartphone sales, don't forget, smartphone is different from the old Nokia. Remember the old Nokia? Smartphone is you have a computer in your hands, a powerful computer. You can communicate. Oh, by the way, uh, we do all our phone calls. You know, with my new company, we have to be very frugal and we don't want to spend too much money on long distance calls. How do we make our long distance calls? With WhatsApp. So just a minute ago, I was talking to my partner in London, Greg Konietzny, WhatsApp. This is the power of the tele, because it doesn't cost you anything. I'm using data. So you're seeing this incredible increase in smartphone sales. Back in 2008, about 100 million were sold. Uh, now you've got over a billion sold each year. And 70% of those sales are in emerging countries. So this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a big, huge impact. You know, on this trip to India, I noticed Amazon all over the place. And Flipkart, Flipkart is the Amazon of India. Uh, bought, I think uh, Walmart bought into that. And they're selling like crazy because of these smartphones. People are ordering on their smartphones. India internet users are going up like wildfire. You can see the increase there because the prices are coming down. The richest man in India and one of the richest in the world is Mr. Ambani. And he has a cell phone company where he's offering smartphones for about the equivalent of 25 US dollars to, to people in India. This is an incredible change that's taking place. And of course, the average cost, as I mentioned, is going down in India as well. And this is happening globally. Now, we are value investors. We believe in buying cheap stocks. And if you look at value for emerging markets, you'll see the price earnings ratio for emerging markets is much, much less than of the developed countries. And if you look at the trends, you'll see that Recently, both the global markets and emerging markets have gone down in terms of price earnings ratio, so they're all getting more and more attractive. If you look at price to book value, again, emerging markets companies are cheaper than the developed market companies. And again, if you look at the trends, you'll see that emerging markets have hardly moved over the last five years. In fact, they've gone down in terms of price to book. So we're buying cheaper and cheaper stocks. 
Currencies, a lot of people ask about currencies, they're afraid of the currency risk. And the important point to remember is that emerging market currencies are now cheap. They've gone down dramatically. This is the emerging markets index of currencies, and you'll see that we're way, way down to low level. Some of these currencies have lost incredible amounts of money. Now look at this, Argentine peso, down by 90%. Turkish Lira down by 80%, Brazilian Real by 60%, and so forth and so on. So with US dollars, I'm buying a lot more local currency and hopefully buying the cheap stocks at the same time. Now, a lot of people ask about ESG. I was on a, uh, one of the uh, cruises sponsored by the Money Show. Uh, I don't remember the one in Australia, Kim. And uh, I was talking to one of the investors there, and I said, uh, you know, I'm interested in ESG. She said, what's that? I said, it's environmental, social, and governance. She said, can I make money with that? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so, but we are in a new era. And one of the things we found in this ESG is that it does matter about performance. Because if you look at the Emerging Markets Index of the leaders in ESG, you know, they have a way of ranking these companies and putting them in an index. The ESG leaders perform better than the other companies. And I think one of the key reasons is that companies that pay attention to ESG usually are probably better managed. So that may be one of the reasons why you see this better performance. And ESG strategies are now taking a bigger and bigger share of the total market because investors are now asking, hey, we want to invest in good ESG companies. We are looking in our company more and more at this and we decided in order to have E, environmental, in order to have S, social, you gotta have G governance. You have to have good governance in companies. And we found in this study that companies that engage with shareholders perform better. They have a much, much better performance if they have successful engagement. So that's what we're trying to do in talking to companies, say, look, let's work together to improve your governance. Get independent shareholders. I remember many years ago, we invested in Turkish Airlines. Uh, there's call letters is uh, THG. In those days, it meant they hate you because the service was so bad. And we uh, talked to the president of the company and said, look, uh, you know, we would like to recommend uh, an independent director. And uh, because in those days, you know, they had all government people at the directorships. So he said, well, I'm, I'm willing to do that, but you had to go to Ankara to talk to the minister. So we went up and talked to the minister of transportation, and we said, sir, we'd love to suggest independent director. He says, why not only one, why not two? I was shocked, you know, it was the new government that came in, wanted to reform. We also knew of a company that did very good catering in Austria that was owned by a Turkish gentleman. And we introduced him to Turkish Airlines. They accepted to have him as a caterer. Now if you fly Turkish Airlines, the food is incredible. It's one of the, one of the reasons why people fly that airline. So you can see the engagement really helped. And of course the stock price did very, very well. Um, commodities, a lot of people ask me about commodities and say, gee, you know, commodities are going down. Uh, is it worthwhile? You must realize that don't forget, a billion people in China, a billion people in India, they want to have the standard of living that you have here in America. That means they need commodities. You can't get away from it. So commodities demand will continue to go up. And if you look at the iron ore, for example, by the way, we were invested in Valle do Rio Doce in Brazil, uh, exports a lot of iron ore. You can see the red line, demand is going up. 
the price is going down, but the demand is going up. So be careful. Sometimes you look at the newspaper and they'll say, oh, uh, I know uh, demand is going down. That's in dollars, not in quantity. So be careful when you look at these numbers. A good example, again, is crude oil. A lot of people say, oh, demand for crude oil is going down. No, it's going up. The price is going down, but the demand, demand continues to go up. And if you look at copper, copper still demand is very good. Uh, price, of course, is down. And if